Following on from the discussion of principal component analysis in the previous video, this video introduces another ordination method called non-metric multidimensional scaling. The name is obviously kind of a mouthful, so it's often just called NMDS or MDS. It's more commonly been used in biology, also in paleontology, but there are certainly other examples in earth sciences where this could be a good method to use. So just a recap of ordination methods in general. So ordination is a technique used to simplify multivariate data, reducing it from many dimensions down to just a few important axes. In that way, it's possible uh, to graph the data to recognize and interpret patterns. So the main goal is to recognize gradients that hopefully reflect the underlying geological or physical or chemical or whatever processes. There are a number of types of ordination, and we're not going to cover them all in this class. The last video discussed principal component analysis. In that, it used a fixed distance measure, so it used Euclidean distance between the samples, and it created the new ordination axes from the eigenvectors of an association matrix. And by doing so, it imposes a linear relationship between the samples. So that may not be good for certain cases. In contrast, NMDS allows you to choose any distance measure that might be suited for your data, and it uses an iterative method for creating the ordination results. In that way, it doesn't make any assumptions of a linear relationship. So basically, NMDS arranges the points on the ordination plot in the way that maximizes the rank order correlation between the real world distances, we could say, um, and the distances in that ordination space. So basically you start out with the complete multivariate data set which has measurements of lots of things or counts of lots of things. Here I'm using species counts because this method is often used for this sort of data. And so you have these, these measurements or counts in many different samples. You can choose your own appropriate distance measure, which I'll come back to in a second, uh, and then you calculate this distance of a matrix of distances between each sample or each site. These distances are measured in the full multivariate space. This is like if you measure the distance in all, like in the 12 dimensional cloud of points or the 20 dimensional cloud of points, that's what you would get. So next, the computer places our samples or our sites in ordination space say in two axes, two dimensions, or in three dimensions, or, or whatever. And then it calculates the Euclidean distance between all the samples or sites in that two-dimensional ordination space, or three-dimensional, or whatever you're using, to get a second distance matrix. So the first distance matrix is in the real full-dimensional space, and it's using the measurement for distance that you chose, and the bottom distance matrix is just in the reduced ordination space, so just in the two dimensions or then just in the three dimensions, and it uses Euclidean distance between that. So basically then the points are moved around in ordination space until the computer can find the best arrangement, the one that has the highest correlation between the two ranks, or between the rank orders of those two distances. So NMDS has some clear benefits for certain types of data. The rank order, or non-metric in its name approach is very good when you wouldn't expect a linear relationship between the variables. And so that's particularly true when you're dealing with abundance counts, like counts of, of how many individual animals of a particular species you find at each place. This is what the method was really designed for in the first place. So the ability to choose, again, a distance measure that's specifically designed for your data. So if you have these like counts of species, you might use Bray-Curtis dissimilarity. If you're dealing with like presence, absence for, for species in different regions, like biogeography, you could use a card coefficient or one of many, many others. We're not really going to get into distance uh, measures beyond this, but there are a million of them perhaps. Um, so this ability is a big plus. But the main downside is that you must choose beforehand whether to perform ordination in two dimensions or three dimensions or some other dimensionality. And so because the points um, are optimized, in that particular space, the 2D plot and the 3D plot won't look the same. And it's also possible, it's a, potentially a drawback, that this iterative process may find a solution sort of like the local best solution, but there's, but isn't the best possible solution in all possible choices. Um, this typically isn't too big of a worry with the algorithms that are used these days, but it is a potential uh, drawback. 
So the method uses this iterative technique, basically trial and error, to find the best arrangement of points in ordination space. Um, and in this case, best is defined by this parameter called stress. It's a measure of the goodness of the fit of the relationship. So the plot here, which is something we call a shepherd diagram, shows the distance, or in this case the dissimilarity, um, on the x-axis, which is in, this is the measure of dissimilarity or distance in the full dimensional real world sense, in our original complete data set. Um, and the y-axis shows the distance as measured in ordination space. So if the fit was perfect, there would be a perfect rank order correlation between the two so that the points would fall along a continuously increasing or a monotonic line. So monotonic just means that the values either only increase or only decrease. And so the stress is calculated from the residuals of the points, the blue dots, around that monotone regression line, which is the red line. So by definition, stress, which is this mismatch between the ordination fit and the real data, must always decrease as you consider more dimensions. Dimensionality is often given the letter K in, the, in this context. And this sort of intuitively makes sense. I mean, if your original data has five dimensions, and you do your ordination in five dimensions, you can fit it perfectly. You can get a perfect match because you just are using the exact same space. But it's a little bit, you know, it's sort of, it should be pretty good to do it in four dimensions, but a little bit harder in three, and a little bit harder in two, and when you get to one dimension, it's going to be really hard to arrange those points in such a way that you preserve all of the distances among them in the original five dimensions. So you're losing progressively more information, so it becomes harder to capture the true relationships. And remember that the two-dimensional solution is not going to be a projection of the arrangement of points you might get with higher dimensions. So you can't just like say, I'll do it in five dimensions and just look at axis one and two, because as we'll see, the axes don't actually mean anything, uh, and that is not the same as if you did it just in two dimensions. So given that, how many dimensions do you choose? How do you know what to do? Well, I mean, it's possible although a little difficult in R, to create a scree plot that shows stress versus number of dimensions. Uh, but in practice, people pretty much just do the ordination in two or three dimensions because it gets a little unwieldy to look at more. Um, but you should, at least if you're doing that, make sure that the fit is somewhat reasonable in the two dimensions or the three dimensions that you're looking at. So there are some rules of thumb, basically, that a stress greater than 0.2 is, is a fairly poor fit, and there might be some risk of making error when you interpret the relative position between the points. A stress between 0.1 and 0.2 is, is an okay fit. Maybe some of the distances might be a little bit inaccurate, but overall it's pretty good. And a stress between 0.05 and 1 is said to be quite good, and you should be able to make pretty confident inference about the relative position of the points. And then a stress less than 0.05 is really excellent, but you almost never really see this when you're dealing with complicated data. So the ordination plot looks somewhat similar to other ordination, like principal component analysis. Uh, the distance between the samples, your 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 samples or your sites, which is which are shown here at the colored circles, indicates their relative similarity. So the points that plot close to each other have quite similar composition in terms of the original variables, the measurements or the counts, and points that plot far apart are, are quite different. So unlike in PCA, the variables, which are the measurements, the measured parameters, or the counts of the items or the species or whatever, are also shown as points, or you, you're, you're able to do that. Um, and so what this means is that if a variable, which are the little crosses here, I didn't label them all, um, plots close to a particular sample, that indicates that that sample contains high values of that variable. So in this case, where the variables are species, it tells you which species tend to be more common in, in which samples or in which groups of samples. So you should use your knowledge and other information about the samples to qualitatively identify gradients in those samples. So in this example, I've color-coded the samples by regions, so the red ones and the blue ones come from different places around the world. So you can see kind of a nice separation between the two, two regions. So basically, you use other information and maybe color code your points or use different symbols for your points to be able to, you know, sort of qualitatively or visually look for gradients or clustering or separation between these, these groups that you might know of. Okay, so unlike in PCA, these points, remember, are arranged by this iterative process. So it turns out that the axes don't actually mean anything. 
Remember in PCA, the axes correspond to these eigenvectors that explain a particular amount of the variance. So because here the axes really are not that meaningful, um, you can rotate the pl plot, you can translate it so you can shift it from left to right or up and down. Um, you can scale it so you can enlarge it or you can shrink it as long as you retain the relative distances. So I said that the axes don't mean anything, but I will note that in R, uh, if you're doing this, the what, what, what it does is that it actually performs a PCA on your ordination results after they're obtained. So axis one is supposed to be the greatest variation, greatest variance in the ordination space. So not the original data, but in ordination space. Okay, so to summarize, I'll just wrap up with a couple suggestions for choosing ordination methods. So if Euclidean distance is appropriate, and if there generally are linear relations between the variables, uh, principal component analysis, or PCA, is, is often a good one to use. And, and this applies probably to most types of geological data, especially if you have measurements on a continuous scale. So really, in, in, in most cases, PCA is going to be quite a reasonable one to use. Um, if you can rely on a linear relationship, but you maybe want to use a different distance measure, like if you had biogeographic data with presence or absence of species and regions, you could use something called principal coordinate analysis, which we're not going to cover in this class. And so the one case where NMDS is really most widely used is with abundant count data in multiple samples. So especially counts of biological species abundances in different samples. In that case, you really cannot assume a linear relationship, and there are specific distance measures designed for that sort of data types. I've also seen NMDS used um, for ordination of, for example, detrital zircon age spectrum data in the geosciences. So I'd say there probably are more circumstances in earth sciences where it could be a, a, a good method, but it really has been most widely used in biological sciences to this date.